Okay, for this talk I'm going to start by going into the Wayback Machine, way back to 1992 uh, when uh, the uh, original George Bush and Bill Clinton were running against each other. At this time uh, I was a first year student in college and I was uh, following this election very closely. I was really on top of uh, politics and civics stuff then. I knew the Constitution inside and out, knew the government uh, uh, positions very well. I was really on top of this and I was really engaged. I was the sort of ideal uh, voter at this point, you would think, except that I wasn't allowed to vote. Um, why was this? Was I a convicted criminal? No, I haven't been convicted yet. Um, uh, <laughs> was I a uh, Kenyan-born, radical, Muslim, socialist peacenik? Uh, no, I had my American birth certificate to show, so it's all right on that front. Uh, um, registration, I was on top of that too, but I still wasn't allowed to vote. Why not? Well, I was 17, and uh, um, at least in the U.S., uh, not in all countries, but at least in the U.S., uh, most places you need to be 18 to vote, and I was only 17. And so this was a, a sort of matter of resentment for me, and I've resented it ever since. And, you know, of course, I've been able to vote in more recent, re more recent elections, but, uh, you know, this is small consolation in sort of the way that if you've been discriminated against for one job and you, people point out, well, look at these other jobs that you weren't discriminated against for, that's small consolation for, for the one that you were discriminated against for. So I sort of taken this personally over the years, and so now uh, this talk is my chance to, uh, to uh, uh, inflict that upon you. So uh, I'm going to be talking about voting ages and what reasons there are for uh, having a voting age at 18. Um, and really, this is an old debate. This is a debate that the Founding Fathers had. Um, so on one side, we had uh, people like Alexander Hamilton and John Adams and James Madison um, who were advocating a uh, very restricted vote. So they, their sort of picture of the voter is the sort of uh, educated, white, male landowner. This is the sort of person they thought ought to be voting and that uh, the franchise should be restricted just to people like that. Um, on the other side, we had people like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson who thought that uh, um, pretty much everybody, well, for them, everybody was still male and white, um, but uh, uh, they were willing to let poor people and uh, less concerned about age restrictions than um, people on the other side were. And so they had this big debate, and basically they couldn't figure out uh, what the policies ought to be, and so they punted. They uh, uh, left it up to the states to decide this issue, and. Over the years, we've uh, had a number of constitutional amendments uh, extending the vote to uh, black people, to women, to 18-year-olds. Uh, um, and so uh, that's uh, been mostly the extent of sort of federal law on these matters. And the states, for the most part, at least on voting age, have stuck with 18, though there are some municipalities, at least, that allow uh, younger people to vote in the US. And there are other countries that have lower voting ages. OK. so. Uh, as I talk about this stuff, we'll talk about uh, some of the arguments that both of these uh, sites have given, though uh, for them, a lot of this was tied together with questions about whether poor people and women and minorities should vote. And so actually, as I start, oh, by the way, uh, just judging this by currency, it looks like uh, um, James Madison's on the $5,000 bill. Uh, so, uh, this, so it looks like the Federalists had this one. Um, <laughs> good. So. Um, I'm going to start with uh, arguments that have been given nowadays because uh, basically it's been settled that women should vote and minorities should vote and uh, poor people should be allowed to vote now. And so, um, so basically age is the issue that's still up. And so here are arguments given this year uh, by people in uh, New Hampshire where uh, this is actually about uh, college students, whether college students should be allowed to vote in the town that they go to college in rather than needing to go back to their parents' home and vote there. But these arguments would apply equally to younger kids as well. So here's one of the New Hampshire representatives saying uh, college students uh, have a dearth of experience and a plethora of easy self-confidence that only ignorance and inexperience can produce. And so that's a sort of justification for thinking that I should try to keep them from voting. Um, and here's the speaker of the New Hampshire uh, House uh, saying uh, are they uh, uh, the students don't have life experience and they just vote their feelings. And so this seems to be, you know, you get similar sorts of expressions like this from the Founding Fathers um, who also had the same views about uh, women and uh, men without property um, as they did about children. And it's sort of embarrassing actually reading uh, the statements where they switch so easily back and forth between these. Um, so here's sort of highlighting these uh, sort of characteristics that uh, 
um, these people attribute to young people and suggest, well, this is the reason we shouldn't allow them to vote. They have too much self-confidence, they're ignorant, inexperienced, they'll just vote their feelings. Um, and so you could contrast this against the sort of ideal voter that um, uh, the Federalists had in mind, this person who uh, is appropriately humble, who's well informed, who's experienced, um, and who carefully thinks things through. And so this is probably a pretty attractive picture to lots of us as free thinkers. This is sort of the way we like to think of ourselves as being, at least a lot of the time. And you know, probably lots of us have had the thought, well, what if voters were like this? Also, it would be great. Um, and so this is you know one sort of way of sort of motivating. Here's a picture of what uh, voters should be like. Um, of course, one concern about this, especially when I read this list of characteristics here, is and think about the actual American electorate, is you know, <laughs> there are lots of people uh, above uh, the uh, the age of 18 who uh, also seem to have an abundance of self-confidence, ignorance, and experience, and seem to be uh, driven largely by their feelings, and so. Um, if you're thinking about these sorts of issues, um, it's, it's not clear that uh, this, you know, 18 is really the dividing line between this sort of ideal rational voter um, and the people with all these undesirable characteristics. Um, so here's uh, some uh, evidence of this from various polls. Um, so shortly before the uh, 2004 election, this is a poll by University of Maryland um, talking to Bush supporters. So 72% of them said that we had found WMDs in Iraq. This is something that Bush himself wasn't saying at that point that we had found them. He admitted that we hadn't. Um, and it was in the news and the reports uh, said that we hadn't. Um, and yet 72% thought that we had. And furthermore, 58% of them thought that had we known there weren't weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, then it would have been wrong to go to war in Iraq. And so it seems like this is really relevant information. Information they're saying would be relevant to decisions about uh, war leadership on this stuff, um, and yet many people were, on all accounts, misinformed about it. Um, here's uh, some more recent stuff. This is all from this year. Um, so the Obamacare that was passed last year, only 52% of Americans know that it's still in effect. 22% uh, of them think it's been repealed already, and the other 26 or so percent um, don't know whether it's still in effect or not. And the you know, Obamacare is going to be one of the main issues in the next election, and this is the electorate that we're looking at. They don't know whether it's in effect or not. Um, Another thing recently, uh, looking at uh, federal budget lines, uh, uh, the median estimate of how large a portion of the federal budget goes to uh, public broadcasting is 5%, um, and the median estimate for how much of the federal budget goes to foreign aid is 10%. Um, and you know these would be huge, huge numbers if they were right. Uh, in fact, for foreign aid, it's about 1% of the federal budget does it. Um, for uh, public broadcasting, it's about one one hundredth of one percent is the amount of the federal budget that supports public broadcasting. Um, I thought about putting a pie chart up of that, but actually the resolution limits of the monitor rounded to the nearest pixel that it wouldn't show up on the monitor if I put up a pie chart of how much. Uh, um, and yet, you know, it's a big issue now uh, going through uh, uh, the legislature about defunding uh, public broadcasting, and uh, people have pretty big misperceptions about what's going on in these cases and that this is making a difference to policy. If people were better, if the voters were better informed about this, you might wonder whether policy would be decided in the same way. Good. Okay, so a natural thing thinking about this, if you're driven by this sort of ideal of the, the rational, well-informed voter, is to think, well, maybe instead of just using 18 as our cutoff to try to figure out who the rational, well-informed people are, maybe we could have you know, a bit better honed way of figuring this out. And so this leads people to suggest things like a civics literacy test or something like that. Um, and whenever this comes up, it's probably really important to be very careful to talk about, uh, you know, the very uh, uh, poor history that uh, our country has with these sorts of things. So we had lots of Jim Crow laws that had uh, literacy tests that were used basically to discriminate and disenfranchise uh, minority voters. And so um, given this history, any sort of attempt to ever institute this is, is going to have to tread extremely carefully at best. So um, 
It is worth noting, though, that just because this has been abused, there are pretty obvious ways in which it was done wrong. And so just because it has been done wrong doesn't necessarily mean that it couldn't be done right. Um, so here are a couple ways in which it was done wrong. One is that uh, um, literacy tests in the past were discriminatorily applied. Basically, election officials, who tended to be good old boy white people, could decide who they were going to apply the literacy test through and who they'd let through without the literacy test. And so, guess what? They applied it just to black people and not to white people. Um, and another issue is that these tests often involved extremely irrelevant questions, questions that wouldn't make any difference to how well somebody would vote in an election. So here are some examples. This is from Georgia's 1958 um, literacy test. Uh, who is the solicitor general of the state judicial circuit in which you live? And who is the judge of such circuit? If it has more than one judge, name them all. Um, I bet none of us in here, you know, even in my most politically engaged days, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question. And so, of course, the poor black people who uh, got assigned to answer that question, of course they were disenfranchised. You, you wouldn't expect anybody to answer this question. Um, and it wouldn't matter whether people can answer this question. This isn't going to help you decide um, which representatives to elect anyway. Um, here's one from Alabama, 1965. In what year did the Congress gain the right to prohibit the migration of persons, of persons to the states? The answer is 1808, but who cares? You know, that's 200 years ago. Um, it's, well, at that point, is 150 years ago. Um, it's just not relevant to the decisions that were to be made at that point. Um, it was just an excuse to disenfranchise people. Um, so it seems like if anybody was going to do literacy tests like this, these are obviously wrong. Um, but on the other hand, we do do some sorts of testing that seem not to be so wrong. So. Uh, um, Probably all of us who drive had to take a driver's exam at some point, uh, which is a sort of driving literacy test um, to show that you knew what the rules of the road were, uh, had the basic ideas about how to drive. Um, and for the most part, these aren't horrible discriminatory sorts of things. In fact, I kind of like it that the other drivers on the road needed to pass a test like this before they were allowed to drive. In fact, I think maybe it'd be good if they had a more stringent test given all the stupid drivers that I run into. Well, I don't literally run into on the road <laughs> uh, too often. Good. So a uh, couple of things to note about driver's tests uh, that they're doing this better. One is that they aren't discriminatorily applied. You, you don't make only black people take the driver's test and, and not make white people. Instead, everybody needs to take the driver's test. Um, and the sorts of questions that are on the driver's test, these are relevant questions to being able to be skilled as a driver. And so um, I'll cross out the ear here. Um, so. Uh, so it seems like this is an instance of doing something like that. And you might think, well, what justifies having driver's tests? Well, if you get behind the wheel of the car, you could cause serious harm. And you might think, well, if you vote stupidly, you might also cause serious harm. And so the same sort of justification <laughs> you'd have for having a driver's test might be reasons to have uh, tests for voting um, as long as we did care to not have it be abused the way that it has been in the past. Good. OK. So. Uh, you could imagine two versions of this proposal. One would be as uh, people passing a voting test um, as an extra way to allow, be allowed to vote. So a, a way to include smart kids in voting if they could pass this test. Then, So what if you're 17 or 15? Um, if you can pass this test, um, you're a citizen, you pay taxes, you should go ahead and, uh, and be able to vote. Um, more controversially, you could use this as a, a way of excluding ill-informed people from voting. Um, and this, this is a lot more problematic and a lot harder to support. But uh, you could imagine both of these proposals um, being considered. And both of these fit pretty well with the sort of ideal of voters as being these sorts of well-informed, rational decision makers. Good. Um, how would this play out in the, the current tug of war between Republicans and Democrats? Um, there's some reasons to think it might go in uh, in both directions. So uh, on one hand, uh, when these sorts of restrictions are raised, um, they typically are raised by Republicans. Democrats typically realize that they have uh, a, a whole lot of voters voting Democratic who might have trouble passing these sorts of tests. And Republicans uh, have recognized this. And so Tam Tancredo, who is a presidential candidate, uh, in the Republican primary last election, uh, basically has advocated having a civics literacy test and thinks that Obama wouldn't have won the election if we'd had something like that, which is, in his eyes, all the more reason to have a civics literacy test. So uh, 
Um, the conventional wisdom probably is this would help Republicans. Um, but on the other hand, there's interesting sorts of data. Um, Pew uh, uh, Research has uh, studied uh, people's uh, well-informedness about current events and uh, comparing people getting news from, news from various sources and basically daily show viewers who tend to be uh, voting Democratic um, are at the top of the list of being the most well-informed about current events and right at the bottom of the list is uh, people who uh, uh, watch Fox News. And in fact, in other studies, uh, the more you watch Fox News, the worse informed you tend to be about issues. So, um, so you might think that there's, there's some uh, hopes of, of something like this, uh, favoring, uh, Democrats also. So it's, it's not clear which direction this would go. Instead, it seems like mostly it would just be moving more in the direction of this ideal of voters as being these well informed rational agents. Good. Um, but here are some concerns about this. Here's a graph of uh, all the people in the population by age on the horizontal axis. So we go from the newborns up to the, uh, the uh, people who are in nursing homes. Um, and uh, the blue ones are the ones who vote, and the red ones are the ones who don't vote. Um, and so you can see uh, some things in this, map, in this graph. You know, one thing is here's all the kids who aren't allowed to vote, so they can't vote. Um, even after people are allowed to vote, um, especially people who are who are young, who are working, uh, maybe multiple jobs, um, they tend to vote in a lot lower numbers than older people do, and especially retirees uh, show out in very large numbers to vote. Um, and so uh, there's a sort of breakdown, and if you imagine, well, if we had a literacy test on top of this, a sort of civics liter literacy test, um, who's that going to affect? And it seems like it's very likely to take the people who are already busy enough that they aren't turning out to vote very much, they probably also aren't going to, they're probably also going to be so busy that they aren't going to have the chance to, to study for and pass the test also. So it's probably going to disproportionately affect this portion of the population as opposed to the portion that already has plenty of time to vote now and could take the time to take the test also and to, to brush up on it if they need to. So uh, this would likely uh, shift the demographics of voters so it's even less representative of the population as a whole. Um, and you might have worries about this, that uh, you know, as it is, uh, you know, working uh, uh, you know, young and middle-aged people already are underrepresented in the electorate as it is, and it seems like it would get even more so on this proposal. And that's a sort of uh, concern about it, is that it might shift policies in a direction that, that, that less well represents the interests of a, a large portion of the population. Um, there are also just concerns involving time and money. It would take time and money from the various voters. It would take uh, time and money from the government to uh, have these tests, to publicize whatever information you need to publicize before the test. Um, and so you might wonder about this sort of expense. It seems like part of one of the virtues of having the political system we have is that uh, we elect our representatives. We don't have to be expert on lots of issues. Instead, we'll choose good people to be our representatives, and they'll go uh, delve into the details, figure out uh, what the right thing to do is, and that's a nice division of labor to have, that we shouldn't need to spend all this time and money uh, becoming experts on everything um, as long as we can basically hire experts, uh, representatives, and senators to do this for us. So um, one way of justifying that sort of uh, view is uh, this old theorem uh, called the Condorcet Jury Theorem, which basically says if you get a bunch of people together, even if none of them's terribly good at judging a particular matter of fact, um, as long as uh, they tend to be at least a little bit correlated, and this correlation can be pretty low, like 52% uh, um, chance of getting it right as opposed to getting it wrong, um, put a bunch of people together like that, it's sort of like flipping a coin a bunch of times. If the coin's f f weighted a little bit towards heads, flip it 12 times or 100 times or 10,000 times, um, the side that it flips more often is almost certainly going to be the side that it is weighted towards flipping more often. And you basically get the same thing when you pull a bunch of independent jurors or a bunch of independent voters together. Um, and so this suggests, well, we don't actually need well-informed voters. All we need is voters that are at least a little bit correlated with the right answers to give. And so uh, going back uh, again to put the uh, graph that we considered before together, um, if together with this idea of the jury theorem, um, well, if we're thinking, well, what's the right answer in voting cases? And, and maybe this is a little tough when you're figuring out well, what it, the right answer is, but uh, at least 
one plausible view is the answer that serves the people or the will of the people the best seems to be the answer that uh, a lot of people working on democratic theory think that's the right answer for a democracy to arrive at. And here it seems like, well, getting lots of people to vote, um, that's going to be the way to go to end up having a jury that'll tend to uh, be well correlated with the uh, the actual will of the people. So this woman took the the voting is for old people shirt and scratched out old and changed it to voting is for all people. And it seems like this sort of reasoning leads you towards that sort of conclusion. Um, it's worth noting that if this is the sort of reasoning we're doing, then there we'd lose our reason for saying that 17 year olds and 15 year olds shouldn't vote, even if they happen to be less experienced, less well informed, um, more emotional than at least some of the grown-ups are, still, as long as they're somewhat correlated with what's in their interest, this sort of reasoning suggests we should be including them to have a better statistical detector of what the will of the people is. Um, and so uh, that's uh, suggesting really we ought to be considering ways of having kids vote after all. So here are uh, three ways, uh, three different options that have been suggested for uh, including more youth voting. Um, so one is just to lower the voting age. The uh, numbers that are often considered are 16 and 15, and uh, some other countries have used these uh, lower voting ages. Um, another option is just let everybody who's capable of going in and reading the ballot and casting a vote, uh, cast a vote regardless of their age. Why, uh, why exclude citizens of our country from voting um, if they're capable of voting and want to go in and vote, uh, why exclude some of them? Um, they're still going to be at least somewhat correlated with what's in their interest, and, and that's good enough as far as the jury theorem is concerned. So why discriminate on this basis? Um, and then third sort of proposal is, well, what about kids who are too young to vote? They're citizens. They have interests. Shouldn't we want our policies to reflect what's in their interests? Um, if they can't vote for themselves, um, who's going to be most likely to be able to judge what's in their interests? Um, this proposal has, well, their parents would be. And so the proposal is, well, parents would actually get extra votes on behalf of their kids. And basically, you give mom half a vote and dad half a vote. And in case mom and dad disagree, yeah. um, they can uh, vote for kids. And uh, this uh, has been advocated by the demographer Paul de Meni. Um, and uh, it's been uh, strongly considered. In Germany, this has come up for vote uh, several times. Japan's seriously considering it, in large part because they have uh, Basically, uh, their reproduction rates are lower than replacement, so their, their population is shrinking and getting older and don't have enough young people to be taking care of the older people, and so they're asking, well, what can we do to come up with policies that are more family friendly? And well, the thought of, well, let's uh, make sure that kids are represented in the voting process rather than just having old people drastically overrepresented in the uh, voting process. And so people have taken this seriously as a potential. Obviously, there are lots of concerns about this, about parents uh, selfishly voting their own interests against their kids and stuff like that. But still, um, you, you've got to weigh what the various options are and decide which one is best. So let's go back to our tug of war. How would this affect uh, the tug of war if we include lots of kids' votes? Um, here, this also seems to be pretty split. There are lots of things that involve sort of present benefits and costs that aren't going to be felt until the distant future. So things like deficit spending, where it's basically going to be our kids who end up paying off uh, our current deficit spending. Uh, things like uh, environment. We'll mess up the environment and enjoy our big cars. Our kids will live with the air pollution and the global warming and stuff like that. Um, and so it seems like the more we can represent young people's votes, um, the more seriously we'll need to take these sort of long-term costs of the policies that we're considering. And these um, especially deficit spending has been a traditional Republican issue. Uh, the environment has been a traditional Democratic issue. So um, this seems to cut across party lines. Um, other things, uh, family values, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it seems like having families have more votes it would be a way of promoting family values. Um, and certainly uh, some of the family values that uh, Democrats have pressed, like uh, education, it seems like uh, uh, families with kids in them are, are going to be interested in making sure that there are college loans available, stuff like that. So it seems like these issues, again, it's a sort of split between which party is going to benefit the most from it. Instead, we're just sort of increasing the franchise to represent more people. Um, but both parties have different ways of representing those people's interests already. Um, there are a few other issues, especially social issues, where you just get big demographic differences. Like, for example, gay marriage. Uh, if you look at uh, the demographics on this, basically old people regardless of party oppose gay marriage and young per 
people, regardless of party, uh, support gay marriage. And so uh, getting more young voters on social issues like this is going to you know, basically speed up uh, progress. Uh, we don't have to wait for the older people to vote. We could outvote them sooner. Uh, we don't have to wait for the older people to die off. We can outvote them sooner. <laughs> said that wrong. Um, so, uh, so, so it would affect various issues this way, but by and large, it seems like it's not obvious that either party's a clear winner. So again, this is something that could be advocated uh, on a sort of bipartisan fashion. Good. Um, okay, so just in summary, I've talked about these two sorts of conceptions of how voting ought to work and what the ideal of voting is. So uh, one conception had it that voters uh, ideally would be these sort of really well-informed, thoughtful, uh, rational people. Um, and we saw, well, that sort of suggests that a better way of drawing the boundary line isn't just using an 18-year-old cutoff. Um, instead, it's to use some sort of civics literacy test. Um, that would at least allow that smart kids could vote, um, but might have the sort of problematic uh, uh, outcome of thinking that, well, maybe we ought to restrict the right of poor, I mean, poor voters uh, to, uh, to vote um, as adults. And so uh, that's uh, what that sort of uh, ideal would lead to here. Um, on the other hand, if we have this sort of uh, jury theorem ideal that just says, well, the point of democracy is to have the voters vote, and it doesn't matter how well informed they are, um, they'll still be correlated enough with what's in their interests, and you get a whole bunch of them together, the noise will get drowned out by the signal anyway, and so it'll all work out okay. Well, this sort of approach says we ought to let uh, kids vote also because their interests are, are interests of the citizens in the populace. Um, and also has this sort of questionable suggestion that, well, maybe we ought to even be including young kids who, who can't vote for themselves. They're still citizens, and maybe their uh, uh, views should be represented in this process as well. Um, so uh, whichever route we take, you get some sort of questionable things, and you get some sort of departure from the way things are currently. And I couldn't tell you which of these is better. Um, but it is interesting to note um, that uh, Either way, smart kids like me when I was 17 should be allowed to vote. So take that, 1992.